from York Jokla 66 Hour of the Truth in collaboration once again with Inquisition Update which is uh, the name uh, behind which is uh, Tom Fress my brother in Christ from the United States of America Iowa uh, if I'm not mistaken is the state he lives in he has this ministry Inquisition Update already for more than 10 years telling the people of the biggest deception since the Garden of Eden that is futurism and that futurism is based on actually a few little words, especially the word he. Oh, that's something we come to in another broadcast. But the point is that the New Testament, and this is what we are going to prove to you biblically with these broadcasts, that the New Testament is the confirmation of, Jesus's, uh, of Jesus Christ's ministry, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, and that the prophecy of Daniel in chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, has completely and uh, utterly been fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And there is no gap. And when you read the whole New Testament, you will understand with every verse that you read that that is a confirmation that that prophecy is completely being fulfilled. And you will not be caught in the lie of futurism anymore. So to explain that together with me, I do this broadcast with Tom Fress, who I warmly welcome to the broadcast tonight. And we all hope and pray that Tom's voice will hold up through the hour that we have planned to do the reading. Hello, Tom, and welcome to the broadcast. Hello, Yerk, and hello to the listeners. It's my pleasure to be here. Still suffering with laryngitis, but uh, I'll, I'll struggle through. Good. You're a fighter. We know that. Um, so, last time we went in our reading to come to the last verse of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, um, to anoint the most holy. Therefore, I think it is appropriate to do two things before we start the reading today. The first thing is to do that I want to show you on the internet, on my archive library, which uh, link you will find Denise, beneath the video in the description box of the video, on my archive library, I posted this paper, The New Testament Confirms Daniel Chapter 9. Um, it has the title now, um, The New Testament Confirms Daniel's 70th Week Prophecy Fulfilled. Yeah? You see that it was uploaded the, 10th, uh, the 12th of October, that is today. Uh, yesterday, I did that yesterday already. Yeah, that's right, yesterday, not today. And so you can download that paper for yourself. And this still, this, since this is a working progress, means we are also speaking about verses 25, 26, 27, because we have now only dealt with verse 24. 
this paper will be expanded in the future and you can always download the newest version. I will always update it as long as I work on it and make that paper bigger than the just seven pages it has, it has right now. Also, thanks to the wonderful grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, I was shown that the 1611 King James Bible that I thought was the 1611 King James Bible, the AV version is not the AV version that I thought it was. I'm not going into the discussion of um, the different Bibles, but you have to know that the King James Bible also has been edited, and not only into the new King James Bible, but also into what is called a few uh, quote-unquote ameliorations have been made yeah, to make it better. And one version that is the most famous that you can get today everywhere is the quote-unquote Blaney version from 1769. It contains a different punctuation. It contains, uh, well, a easier writing because as you can see what you see on the picture, you see this is an old English writing. And uh, the, 16, uh, the, the King James Bible that you normally find on the internet is the one with the modern writing from 1769, but there have been changes made. And a few weeks ago, um, by the grace of our Lord, I found the YouTube channel and videos of John Durr, who made some videos about these changes in the Bible and pointed out the necessity to get the really, uh, the real authorized version of 1611 of the King James Bible. Uh, for example, you can buy them in print in the Hendrickson view and I, uh, Hendrickson print, and I bought a copy of that and I have now two copies of those here in my home. Uh, one I always take with me when I drive cab, that uh, in, during my cab driving when I read the Bible I can read the true Bible. And otherwise I also found it on the internet, that's what I'm showing you here right now, and the link of that will be found uh, in the description box of the video too. And when you go down here, it says always view all the uh, um, viewing the original 1611 with archaic English spelling. That's this one. Click to switch the standard KJV. So when you click on this, you get the 1769 Blaney version. That is not an as correct version as this one is. So. Those were the things I had to say for the introduction for today. And now, because we are dealing with the last sentence of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 today, I wanted to read to you the whole verse once again, that we can put it all in the right perspective, when then we go start and find to see in which verses in the New Testament we find absolute confirmation of Jesus Christ fulfilling Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, what we have spoken about so far. It says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring an everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now, as you see, these verses are different from what I put in the PDF that we are talking about right now. That is because in the time I prepared this paper, I did not have the knowledge of this real, true, authorized version of 1611 of the King James Bible. Now I do. So in the future, I will of course use these verses. But I can tell you that there are a few changes here. And this is speaking about in verse 26 and in verse 25, which we have not dealt with yet. Here, this air authorized version differs from the 1769 Blaney version, which, by the way, all of a sudden makes sense to me that you can buy that King James Bible even from publishers like Zondervan. You know, Zondervan Publishing is a part of the Fox conglomerate. And the Fox conglomerate is controlled by Rupert Murdoch. And Rupert Murdoch is a knight of uh, St. Gregory, yeah? of quote-unquote St. Gregory, of Pope Gregory. That's a papal order. And when you ask yourself, but why would the publishing company of St. Gregory publish a King James Bible? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it makes sense when you know that the 1769 version is different from this real 1611 version. That's something that popped into my head too. So in the future, 
uh, during the preparing of the other readings, I will use the Bible verses only from this Bible. Um, I don't think that I will change the whole paper again into these old ones because there has not been any uh, any f there have not been found any faults uh, in what we did so far. Uh, the verses that we spoke about are exactly the same, just the writing is a little bit different, but from this verse 25 on, that next time we will go into, uh, I will use these verses here, uh, this King James Bible, the really authorized version of 1611, just to make sure and not to confuse anybody and to explain why there is all of a sudden this quote-unquote archaic old English. And Listen, I am not a native English speaker, and I sometimes have problems reading, but even I can understand this old, quote-unquote, archaic English, and I love it every time more I read it, even though sometimes I think, why is this S-E-U-E-N when it speaks seven? <laughs> okay, it's something you have to get used to when you, when you train a little yourself to that. It comes very easily and naturally to you, and you will easy, easily read it and easily understand it. So that's so far what I had to say on the basis of today, after repeating verse 24 completely. We can go now into the analysis um, that I have prepared here in this paper, together with Tom. But of course, first I want to know if Tom has any comments or remarks on what I said so far. No, so far I'm just, uh, just listening. Good. So, to anoint the most holy is the complete... Um, uh, is the completion of the verse Daniel chapter 9 verse 24. This is why we are going here into into this one. We read in Isaiah, and this is of course a confirmation of the Old Testament, not of the New Testament, but we read in the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 61 verse 1, quote, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Unquote. So we read even from this in Isaiah that this is speaking of Jesus Christ where he is being anointed. The Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. This speaks about Jesus Christ, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, I have not read the book of Isaiah, but I know Tom did, and I think that Tom will confirm that this verse 61 speaks from the point of view of Jesus Christ, correct? Absolutely. It speaks specifically about the anointing of Jesus Christ at the very beginning of the 70th and final week of Daniel's 70-week prophecy. Already had passed for the first seven weeks, then the following 62 weeks, altogether being 69 weeks of years, or 483 years. 483 literal years. And, and, and the total years of the prophecy were 490. So there only was seven literal years left. That is the 70th week of Daniel. And the very first thing that happened... At the very beginning of that 70th and final week was the anointing of the one who was to preach reconciliation and, uh, and good tidings to the meek, to the repentant sinner. And that anointing took place before Jesus began his preaching ministry. It took place in the River Jordan by the one who was prophesied to come, John the Baptist, and who would anoint the Messiah, the preacher, in the River Jordan, and it was witnessed by heaven. Uh, a, a voice came from heaven, and there was a, 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 the Holy Spirit descended and rested upon him like a dove. We also have the testimony of John the Baptist himself uh, proclaiming Jesus uh, whose shoes he was not even worthy to bear. And even he told Jesus, he said, I should be baptized of thee. And Jesus said, never mind. We just follow what we're supposed to do. And John baptized him. That was the anointing of the most holy at the very beginning of the preacher's ministry. That is Jesus's ministry during the 70th and final week 
of Daniel's prophecy. This is fulfillment of Bible prophecy. This prophecy, who your pastor surely proclaims, is not, is not fulfilled at all, but is yet to be fulfilled in the future, which is to say Jesus was not the Messiah. Now, I know your pastor preaches that Jesus was the Savior and the Messiah, but he turns right around and says the 70th week of Daniel is yet future. The question is, which is it? And, and, and we're making the answer very, very simple. The entire uh, 70th and final week and all the prophecies pertaining to it were fulfilled by Jesus Christ, Messiah the Prince, beginning with his baptism until the end of that 70th and final week of years, that seven-year period of time in the midst of which Jesus would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life and becoming the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, making reconciliation for iniquity, bringing in everlasting righteousness. And then for the remaining three and a half years, the Spirit of Christ through his apostles, continued to preach the gospel of reconciliation in his blood to the Jews for a remaining three and a half years to Jew, the Jews and Jerusalem. That's what the prophecy was all about. And when the end of that three and a half year period came, the gospel went to the Gentiles. You want to know pr proof positive that the 70th week of Daniel is, is over and there's nothing to be fulfilled in the future? Just stop and think. Who has the gospel? Who has had the gospel for 2,000 years? Who alone has preached the gospel for the last 2,000 years? It wasn't the Jews, nor was it Jerusalem. It was the Gentiles. It still is the Gentiles. The Jews and Jerusalem are still in denial that Jesus was the Christ, the, the Messiah, the Prince, that Daniel prophesied. But we are not deceived. Jesus was that whom Paul, uh, Daniel spoke when he said, and he shall cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. That happened after three and a half years in the midst of the week. And so uh, uh, you, you must know that if the gospel now rests with the Gentiles, and it's the Gentile nations, the, the believers, the repentant believers of the Gentile world, who are now taking the gospel to the rest of the world, and especially to the Jews, you must know that that cannot be so unless the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy is over. It's already fulfilled. The proof is that the Gentiles preach the gospel to the rest of the world. That responsibility lies with the Gentile believers. So when your pastor tells you that there's a future fulfillment of any aspect of Daniel's 70th week, you must point out that he is either grossly mistaken or he is a liar. And there's only one thing you can do, and that is either replace that minister with one who will tell you the truth or leave the church. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, very, very true, everything you just said. It's uh, very important that we understand that Jesus' ministry began with the anointing. So this Isaiah 61.1, speaking of, because the Lord hath anointed me, you know, Christ means the anointed one. When we speak of Jesus Christ, there is no other being anointed in the time. And we knew exactly the time of his coming, because it speaks of seven weeks, then it speaks of 62 weeks, and that makes 69 weeks. And without any pause in between, when you read the Bible, you see the 70th week, week started. And the 70th week was completed by Jesus Christ's ministry that he started with being anointed in the River Jordan by John the Baptist, as you can see here, uh, can see here in the picture where that is being depicted. Okay? So, in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, it says, And saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. 
that also is of course a confirmation of Jesus Christ. The time is fulfilled. What time is he speaking of? Well, the time of Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27, especially in this case 24. Yeah? The time is fulfilled, the 70th week has started now, the kingdom of God is at hand, that's what Jesus Christ said, and Tom made a very interesting point, I think it was whether in our Bible study <laughs> last weekend that you don't know of, or it was in the last broadcast, that he said, in the book of Acts we can read about, every day there were people and souls added to the kingdom of Christ. Don't go looking for the kingdom of Christ anywhere else, but it is already here. Here, in the beginning, Mark chapter 1, it was at hand. But now the kingdom is here, and it is daily added to the kingdom, saying the time is fulfilled. You know, you have to understand what time is he speaking about. Well, he is speaking about the prophesied time of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. That time is being fulfilled. Here you see again, you start reading the Gospel of Mark and all of a sudden you have the understanding of a complete and utter fulfillment of a prophecy in the Old Testament, namely Daniel. I think this is so important, Tom, that we make that point that even in those little sentences or in those little verses, there is a part of the sentence that you say, well, this refers to Daniel chapter 9. When you read the Bible with the understanding that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy utterly and completely, then you will see in almost every verse popping up, verse, popping up words that give you confirmation that Jesus Christ was and is the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. Right, Tom? That's absolutely correct. And uh, I want to remind the listeners that most futurists will tell you that Christ's kingdom has not yet come. And his kingdom will not come until he returns the second time. But you cannot reconcile that teaching with the written word of Almighty God. The New Testament tells us that the kingdom of Christ is with men. Okay? And this is the, the position that the papacy takes in this regard, that since Jesus is not although the kingdom is with men, Jesus is not visible. And he says that the church, the papacy says, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the antichrist says, that if the kingdom of God is with men, then there must be a visible head. And so the papacy takes that as justification to declare itself to be the visible head of Christ in the world. And we know better, we know differently, because the Holy Spirit was given to be uh, with men until Christ returned. So, ladies and gentlemen, listen carefully. If Jesus said he would send the Comforter, that he would send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to give us all truth, he would be the head of the church, would he not, in Christ's absence? If there is truly a vicar or the replacement of the Son of God while he is uh, with his Father in heaven building many mansions uh, to bring us uh, unto himself, uh, making a place for us, and he left his Holy Spirit to guide and direct the church to witness of sin and of righteousness and of judgment and to teach us all things, then uh, any man who calls himself the vicar or the replacement of Christ, has what? He has blasphemed the Holy Spirit. That is a sin, the Bible says, is not going to be forgiven in this life, nor the life to come. That means the papacy is damned. It's so facto damned. It's not a damnation that's going to come in the future. He is damned yesterday, today, and forever. He is, was, and always will be the man of sin, the son of perdition, the counterfeit Christ, the so-called, the self-styled vicar of Christ, which is literally a name of blasphemy. 
He blasphemes the throne of Almighty God. He blasphemes Christ's Savior status. He blasphemes the Holy Spirit. He's thrice bla blasphemed the throne of Almighty God. And this is what was known of the Protestant, by the Protestant Reformers and every Christian from then all the way back to the first century Christians. Now you say, Tom, but the papacy wasn't in existence during the first century Christians. But Paul told the first century Christians that that power which would come, uh, that would rise after the fall of the current power that was, that was ruling the Middle East at the time, which was the Roman Caesars, once they were taken out of the way, those Caesars who were actually restraining the rise of the papacy, there, there could not be two rulers over the Roman Empire. So the first one, that which was in power at the time that Christ was born, that which was in power at the time of Christ's crucifixion, that power of Rome had to be taken out of the way so the man of sin in Rome could take over. That is the restrainer. Okay, the Roman Caesars were taken out of the way. The papacy stood up in the power vacuum and has fulfilled all the prophecies in the Bible regarding the man of sin, the little horn, the, uh, the, the, the uh, son of perdition, the Antichrist. It is, was, and always will be the papacy. There should be no doubt in anyone's mind who the Antichrist, who the great deceiver is. God did not send his only begotten son to come take upon himself the sins of, 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 of those which God, who God has saved and, 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 uh, and then leave those for whom his son died in jeopardy of falling prey to the deceptions of this man of sin. God does not play fast and loose with the souls for whom his son bled and died. We were supposed to know hundreds of years before the man of sin even drew a breath on the earth. And the early first century Christians under Paul's ministry, particularly the Thessalonians, knew that it would be a Roman power, but it wouldn't come to power until there come a great falling away and the Caesars, the restrainers, were taken out of the way, and then that man of sin would be revealed, and they were simply waiting for him to come. They knew he would come from Rome, he would succeed the Caesars, and he would be more brutal, last longer, and more diabolical than the Caesars ever thought of being. And all of history records everything the prophets, the prophets prophesied about this man of sin. Remember, Prophecy is virtue is in reality history foretold, and it, we have the history, an in, undisputable history that shows us the precise and complete and perfect fulfillment of all of this prophecy. The entire Christian age has been marked by the persecution leveled upon God's people by this man of sin in Rome, even to this very day, and it will continue until Christ returns and destroys it with the spirit of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. But your pastor will, no matter what denomination you're in, they your pastor, no matter how rich and famous he is, no matter what a great orator he is, no matter how great his reputation, no matter how fancy his house, no matter how he's going to tell you a lie. He's going to tell you that this man of sin is not yet in the world. He's yet future, and he's a liar. He's a damnable liar. He's putting you at risk where Christ left no possibility for you to be in jeopardy. He is an enemy of Christ. He's taking away your security. He's making you vulnerable to a man of sin who has ruled and reigned over the Christian, over Christ's kingdom for nearly 2,000 years and pointing in the future to a figment of Satan's imagination. Now I'm telling you, if you believe any portion of that futurist lie, you're in jeopardy of being deceived. 
you if you do not know who the antichrist is just as much as you know who jesus christ is the messiah if you don't know who the Antichrist is, just as surely as you know who Jesus Christ is, then you are in jeopardy of being deceived. And that's the business of the pastors of the churches today, to leave you deceived about who the Antichrist is. I aim, as long as God gives me breath and God gives me a voice, to tell you the truth, the verifiable, historical, prophetic, and biblical truth about the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the Antichrist. He is, was, and always will be the, anti, the, the papacy, the Antichrist of Rome until Christ comes to, re, to, to uh, destroy him with the brightness of his coming and the spirit of his mouth. And if you can't figure out why the governments of the world are so depraved, morally depraved, and so dictatorially controlling, it's because you do not understand who your government takes their orders from. The government of your country, no matter which country in the world, takes its orders from the man of sin, the self-styled vicar of Christ, and that's why your government is in turmoil. That's why your liberties are being taken away from you. That's why you are made to be an abject slave from cradle to grave. And that's why they preach against the Bible. That's why they, they support all the lies that are taught to us in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the public school system. And that's why they've taken the Bible out of the schools. It's because our government serves the papacy. And the more ignorant the people are about the Bible and about history, the easier it is to sell the lie. And your pastors and your churches, almost without exception, are just as much a part of the deception as the, the papacy himself. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. And even on the risk... Um, if I may say so, uh, even on the risk that we are not finishing what we have planned today to finish, um, I want to go into something that you just mentioned. First and for all, I want to say Revelation chapter 17 verse 2 speaks explicitly about the point with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. That's exactly what we were speaking about in the last few moments of your uh, uh, of your point that you were that's just right. making, and that's why with... the people serve the papacy and not the people. Yeah, that's they right. say they say they serve the people, but they actually serve the whore of Babylon. Huh? Here came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, John, saying unto me, "Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore." that sitteth upon many waters. And we know from a later part, I think verse 15 in this chapter, it speaks that the waters that you saw were multitudes, nations, and tongues, yeah, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. What does it mean to fornicate? Well, the kings of the earth do not have Jesus Christ as their husband, but they take the whore and the teaching of their whore. And because they rule over the people in the world, these inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of that fornication. And when you have been made drunk with wine of fornication, you don't think straight anymore. Now, come on. When you're a real Christian and you go out on the streets today, can you tell me that you meet people who can really think straight, especially in these quote-unquote COVID or Corona times, where everyone is, everyone is gagged with a mask? Because that's what it is. It's a gag order. You just didn't understand it that way. Yeah? And all of a sudden, because of this quote-unquote virus, by the way, virus is a Latin word that means poison when you translate it into English, um, this uh, virus is a wonderful tool for ushering in the end times, the end deception of the quote-unquote new world order. 
Yeah, and all of a sudden, all the kings of the earth, which is already written here in Revelation chapter 17, verse 2, they listen to the whore. All of a sudden, all the kings all over the earth, they take the same measures against this quote unquote virus. All of a sudden, the whole economies are being shut down. And listen, I live over here in Belgium, and we had on the time of March, April, when the shutdown came, when, when we were co uh, completely locked down, we had about 700 to 800 infections per day. And they locked the whole country down. Today, we have 7,000 plus infections a day. And we are not locked down yet. Oh, people are afraid of another lockdown, and they are also afraid in other countries. But we have 10 times more infections than six months ago. Then they shut the whole country down. Today, with 7,000, they don't do that anymore. Don't you think that there is something else going on? That there is something not... There's uh, something they do not tell you, <laughs> probably, in this regard? Listen, what Tom just said, that... All the governments of the world work together against the people is written here in the Bible. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with the great whore and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now that's one point I wanted to go into, into what Tom had said. Another point is that what Tom said in the beginning. He spoke about the... Um, the blasphemy or the sin you commit against the Holy Ghost. And that it is written in the Bible that a sin against the Holy Ghost will not be forgiven in this life and not in the next life. Now, that's absolutely true. Now, funny how it is, and you know, coincidence do not exist. I mean, I do not believe in coincidence, and probably you do not believe in coincidence, since you know the Bible and you know that everything is being um, led by the Holy Spirit, led by God, and, and and predestined, more or less, if I can say it so, in easy words. I don't want to start a discussion about, uh, about that point, but that's the way it is. There are no coincidences. Monday evening, that's yesterday evening, I published a reading of the English book from James Edgar Wiley, The Genius of the Papacy, he wrote in 1850. That was the 50th reading that I pub uh, that, no that was the 50th reading I did last night, and I published the 37th reading. And the 37th reading, I read that book in German on my channel. We were speaking about the different sins and about the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church of quote unquote unforgivable sins. Of that unforgivable sins, they strangely enough do not speak about the sin that is made against the Holy Spirit. So I have a paper that I looked up with a, uh, with a friend of mine, with a sister of mine, and we spoke about that today, but this is only in German. I will later try to uh, translate this into English to you and, and give you that also. This says, Sünde gegen den Heiligen Geist. This means the sin against the Holy, Holy Ghost. And this is from catpedia.com. That is the Roman Catholic encyclopedia you can find on the internet in different, different languages. Oh, this is here in English. Maybe if I click on this, it will put this in. No, it doesn't work for the moment. Wonderful. <laughs> okay. So I have this here in German, and I just translated a little part of this. Um, and here it says, uh, what is the difference to mortal sin? Yeah, Because, you know, the Bible says sin is the transgression of the law, and the wager for sin is death. The Bible doesn't make a difference from sins that are mortal and sins that are not mortal, but the Roman Catholic Church does. I mean, I give Tom here one football after the other that he can kick right out of the curb when he gets the mic again. So it says here, difference from mortal sin, as such sin against the Holy Spirit is not identical to mortal sin. However, if this is not repented until death, it becomes a sin against the Holy Spirit, the judgment of on this belongs only to God, who knows the hearts of men and is their judge. Now, this is even not the article that I was looking for, but I didn't have that much time because I wanted to listen to what Tom had to say. Um, we also spoke about something else, but when you look at this, in, in, in um, uh, for example, in uh, Wikipedia, uh, what is the sin against the Holy Ghost? You will see that there are that there are many different sins they speak about, but they do not speak about the sin calling yourself vicarius filii meaning you call yourself 
the replacement of Jesus Christ on earth, because the real, the biblical replacement of Jesus Christ on earth is the Holy Spirit, as Jesus Christ said himself. It is expedient for me to go away, because if I do not go away, I cannot send you the Comforter, and the Comforter will lead you into all truth, speaking of the Holy Spirit. And when you read the Roman Catholic pages about mortal sin, because that's what the point, uh, what the point is that I wanted to make about here, uh, difference to the mortal sin uh, in, the, in the translation, difference from mortal sin, um, is that they count six different sins against the Holy Spirit, uh, six mortal sins, but not one of that mortal sin is uh, anything about calling yourself Vicarius Filii Dei. This is how betrayed this world is, that even the things that you can read in the Bible are not explained, not even on a Roman Catholic website, in this case, um, cathpedia.com, which you can normally get in different languages, but yeah, the English is just not working for the moment. Why that is not working, I don't know. That's uh, Maybe they are in uh, maintenance or whatever. I don't know. It's, it's just interesting to me. And, you know, Tom just spoke about that, that there's one sin that will not be forgiven, not in this life and not in the next life, and that is the sin against the Holy Spirit. And just that we talked about, or that was dealt with in the 37th reading of the Genius of the Papacy, by James Edgar Wiley of 1850 that I published last night and I spoke about with the German sister today. And this is, if you ask me, uh, predestined to, you know, having exact that timing because that video was recorded, I think, three or four months ago. And it was published yesterday. And now we speak again about this. This is a very, very important point. But I think that Tom has something to say about what I just mentioned here, right? Well, I, I will just say this, that uh, the papacy has always claimed uh, the sole teaching authority in Christianity. In other words, whatever is to be taught and whatever is to be believed in the Christian world is to be taught by the papacy. Uh, the papacy declares itself to be the fountain of all truth, the dispenser of all truth. And we know from the scriptures that the Holy Spirit is the guider and the teacher. Jesus de described the Holy Spirit as he who will lead us into all truth. That's knowledge and education, isn't it? About spiritual things. So, by very virtue of claiming to be the sole dispenser of truth, the papacy has blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And this is the reason why there is not peace and unity among the so-called various uh, Christian churches and why they so desperately seek unity is because they do not take heed from the Holy Spirit, who is to guide and direct and to unify the body of Christ, they take their direction and their teaching from the, the, the counterfeit Christ in Rome. And they believe the teachings, not of the Holy Spirit, but the teachings of the papacy. And we find the root, just one example, the, the, the fountain of futurism, that is the belief that Daniel's 70-week prophecy is not yet fulfilled, but won't be fulfilled until the end of time, just seven years before Christ's return. And it won't be Jesus that fulfills it. It'll be the Antichrist fulfills it. That teaching comes straight from the papacy. The papacy is the originator of the futurist teaching that is taught from all the Protestant and evangelical pulpits today. So they do not listen to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not their guider and director, nor is he their teacher. The, the Antichrist of Rome is their teacher, okay? Especially when it comes to eschatology. And uh, because of this diabolical futurist 
eschatology brought to us by the papacy and instilled in the Protestant churches through the Protestant and Evangelical Colleges of, of uh, England back in the early 1800s and then propounded the same way right here in the United States of America, the, Rome, the, the, the Protestant and Evangelical churches in this country are Roman Catholic in their eschatology. And the only way to beat that lie, that deception, is to mark futurism as a product, the brain trust of the Vatican, the real man of sin, the real son of perdition, the real antichrist in Rome, the real deceiver is the papacy, and it is the author and the finisher of futurism. And until we return to uh, 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 seeking the guidance and direction and correction and trust of the Holy Spirit, that which Christ left us to be the teacher, until we return to his teaching, we will be deceived. And the consequences of being deceived on these matters is mortal. Okay? They have the gravest of consequences. And uh, what the Rome is doing is bringing into question who the Christ is and who the Antichrist is, and they're confounding the people and leading them down the primrose path to perdition. You cannot serve two masters, but if you're a futurist, you serve two masters. That's why there's confusion. That's why there's unrest. That's why there's division. Because Rome intended for us to be confused, deceived, divided, and finally conquered by an eternal victory of the papacy over the salvation that Jesus provided for us 2,000 years ago. And if you think any portion of Daniel's 70th and final week is yet to be fulfilled in the future, you've put your own soul in jeopardy. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. So let's go into the next verse. I just read to you Mark verse 15 uh, from chapter 1. Now we go into Luke chapter 1 verse 35. There the Bible says, in another confirmation to anoint the most holy, as the last sentence of Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 reads, quote, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. This also to me is in the understanding and anointing of the Most Holy, because the Holy Ghost will come, will overshadow thee, and that holy thing that will be born shall be called the Son of God. We also go into Luke chapter 4, verse 18. There the Bible says, quote, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Now read Luke chapter 4 verse 18 and compare it with Isaiah chapter, 1, uh, chapter 61 verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Isn't that the same? He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. I mean, this is almost a literal repeat, repetition of exactly Isaiah right. chapter 61 verse 1 and Luke that chapter 4 is, verse 18. That is the anointing 
of the uh, of the Messiah, the Prince, that Daniel prophesied in his seventy week prophecy. This is the anointing that was placed upon Jesus before his preaching began. It was long before his preaching began, and uh, when Jesus received it in history, was at his baptism with John the Baptist. And uh, prophecy was fulfilled. And the preaching of Messiah the Prince began to preach reconciliation, liberty, and bringing in the kingdom, and everything else that Daniel prophesied. Look, you've got to know by now. These, these, these are arguments that cannot be gainsaid. These are arguments that cannot be set aside. This is evidence in the New Testament that cannot be impeached. No matter what your future as pastor says, it will pale in comparison to the black and white literal reading of the New Testament. And if you continue this research and study comparing Daniel's prophecy with that which is written in the New Testament, you will come to the unavoidable conclusion that your pastor's lying to you when he speaks about futurism. Anything he preaches about the 70th week of Daniel is corrupted, it is a lie, and you have the evidence, the proof to prove the charge right there in the New Testament. And any jury, any jury that looked upon this evidence would have to conclude that your pastor is a liar. A child can read the New Testament and see the New Testament is the virtual written witness of the fulfillment of every aspect of Daniel's prophecy. Not one single item is left to be fulfilled in the future. So you've got to ask yourself, what good is this pastor if he cannot even see in the New Testament the perfect and complete fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel just exactly as Daniel prophesied it just exactly as the angel Gabriel revealed it to him thousand years ago, thousands of years ago. And uh, how in the world Satan and all his minions could deceive us into believing a future fulfillment of this. You have to recognize how vulnerable the Christian world has been. And we need to... Uh, uh, gird up our spiritual loins and fight this futurist demon with everything in our spiritual power. Because only, only then will there be any peace and unity in the body of Christ, and not until. Back to you, Yerk. Uh, Tom, we have to take on the whole armor of God, right? And that is described in the book of Ephesians in chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. When we read here in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now what is more spiritually wicked but to take the Bible and to bend it in a way that you say Daniel's 70th week prophecy has not been fulfilled yet completely and utterly by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And taking Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 and Luke chapter 4 verse 18 and putting them side by side as I did just with the reading here, it jumps in your face that the pastor you were listening to is a lying deceiving wolf in sheep clothing. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 8 and also uh, in Acts 10 38 after that. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 8 says, quote, The Holy Ghost is uh, the Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. And in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, we read, again, 
that is right after the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven, in Acts chapter 8, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. God anointed Jesus. What does it say in Daniel? To anoint the most holy. Yeah. And this concludes so far our um, dissertation of Daniel chapter 9 verse 24. And here comes a little summation to understand it again altogether. And he, this is in the context now, the Messiah shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week, which is the 70th week, he, Jesus Christ, shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations, meaning the continued temple sacrifices after Christ's, Christ's one perfect sacrifice, he shall make it desolate, even, <coughs> excuse me, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Behold, your house has been left unto you desolate. This is from Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And we come to the conclusion, and then, of course, we will go later on into Daniel 9, 25, 26, and 27 in different broadcasts after this. But the conclusion for the moment is, we can say, only our Creator can have a covenant with His creation. Do me a favor, look into the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and show me one place where Satan makes a covenant with anyone. Seven weeks plus 62 weeks is 69 weeks plus one week equals 70 weeks. 70 weeks to anoint the Most Holy and to seal up the vision and the prophecy. It is done and this prophecy is being fulfilled, or was fulfilled, I have to say in the correct English tense, was fulfilled by Jesus Christ about 2,000 years ago. And now with this study we have already analyzed Daniel 9.24 and we will go next time into Daniel 9.25, Daniel 9.26 and eventually Daniel 9.27 and then, of course, into all of those, and then even into more verses that show you that the completion of Jesus Christ, of Daniel's prophecy, is shown in the New Testament in almost every verse. That is something Tom and I found when we started our Bible study a few years ago, and we saw virtually under every stone the papacy as being the Antichrist, and Jesus Christ being the Christ, that fulfilled Daniel's prophecy of chapter 9 utterly and completely 2,000 years ago. Tom, you have some remarks for the end of this broadcast today? Yes, I, I challenge the listeners to do their own study. Uh, I've, I've advised uh, people to, if you're not good at memorization, to go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, and print precisely exactly what it's printed there in the King James Version of the Bible, the, the 1611, don't, don't go to the NIV or any of the others, go to the King James Version of the Bible, preferably the original authorized version, the 1611, and print those, those three verses on a 3 by 5 card, and then do your own study of the New Testament and see for yourself if there's not any portion of that prophecy that Jesus did not fulfill and must be fulfilled yet in the future. And your conclusion must be that the 70th week of Daniel is over 2,000 years ago. And God's people... God's true, spirit-led, Bible-believing people. The body of Christ, the true body of Christ, not the counterfeit body of Christ, but the true body of Christ. There's a lot of people in this world that call themselves Christians that are none of it. 
God's true people have known Daniel's prophecy and have seen its perfect and complete fulfillment in Jesus Christ. For 2,000 years, they've been secure in the knowledge that the 70th week of Daniel is fulfilled in Jesus the Messiah, and never did it cross their mind that any portion of that, future, of, of that prophecy was to be fulfilled in the future. Because to believe that, that, in, that Jesus did not fulfill any portion of Daniel's prophecy is the same as saying Jesus was not Messiah the Prince. Okay? The Bible tells us what qualifies a, a, a prophet. If his prophecies come to pass, he is to be fulfilled or he is to be feared. But if any portion of his prophecy does not is not fulfilled, then he is not to be feared. Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled 100%. And it is recorded in the infallible book of history, the New Testament, in the, the authorized King James 1611 Bible. There you have it. In the infallible Word of God, it's an infallible historical record that no historian can challenge without challenging God himself. You have it in your hands. You can pick it up and read it any time. And whenever your pastor, surely he will, tell you about some portion of that passage, that ha that prophecy that has to be fulfilled in the future, you can open your Bible and show him that Jesus fulfilled it and show him where it's written and challenge him to, to, to leave his futurist delusion and return to the historical understanding, the historical fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. Daniel prophesied about Jesus, Messiah the Prince, and not one word in all of Daniel chapter 9 makes reference to any Antichrist. It's not even mentioned. It's not even inferred. It's all about Jesus. And you'll see it with your own eyes. And when you do, you'll realize just how subtle Satan is and just how deceiving he is. His talent for deceiving is second to none. But you'll see it for yourself. Do your own study. Own it. If you do it yourself, you own it. You don't have to wait for a man to teach you. Read the Scripture, read Daniel's prophecy, and read the New Testament, and see for yourself. Let the Holy Spirit guide you and direct you and confirm in your heart once and for all that what they're teaching in the churches is the most ridiculous load of hooey you've ever heard in your life. And then call a spade a spade. Either purge out the futurism out of your church, take back your church, take back your pulpit, put a man of God and an authorized AV 1611 behind the pulpit and start preaching true eschatology as confirmed in history or get out of the church. But we've got to do it. We can't leave it for someone else to do. We've got to do it today. We can't put it off another week, another month, another year, another decade. This country and this world is destined for destruction. When Christ returns, will he find faith upon the earth? Let's see that he does. Let's kick out the future out of our churches and take back that which God gave us. <laughs> Magnify the Lord with me.
Let us exalt His name.